So we've got to um, some of the more meatier bits now. We're still in the generic waves section of the module that I talked about yesterday. Uh, but we've done our definitions now, and you've proved quite satisfactorily that you can handle you know, the sort of calculations we're going to have to do. So I want to look now at these topics one by one. And we'll spend more or less time on them as we go through. And pretty much all of them we will revisit either when we look at sound waves or when we look at electromagnetic waves uh, later on in the module. All right, and I'll try and bring out what they mean in the context of, of those sort of more real phenomena. But for now, we're still on generics. So let's look at reflection first. Oh, actually, this is a preamble, I suppose. Um, and it's, it's useful or useless, depending on how you choose to think about things. Um, I don't find it particularly useful myself, but there are people I know who... Um, think in terms of images and for them uh, this actually works quite usefully. But it's this thing about using um, a geometric construction that was developed first by uh, this guy called uh, Christian Huygens uh, in the 1600s. Uh, and he found uh, empirically uh, that you could predict where uh, different wave fronts, successive wave fronts were going to be, so where the crests of a wave will be after certain periods of time, um, by using this concept of secondary wave fronts. So essentially, uh, what he did, let me try and find my pointer, was to say that if you take every point on a given wave front, so in this diagram it's this wave front here, uh, and you draw around those points a secondary wave, so you start drawing concentric circles out basically, or at least the forward half of a concentric circle, and you do enough of those points around the wave, then the envelope created by those secondary circles that you've drawn will tell you where the next wave front is going to be, where it will, uh, where it will appear. Okay, so in this case we've got um, circular waves and all that means is, I mean, imagine this as vibrations in a, in, in a tank of water. Right? We can produce circular waves really, really easily uh, just by vibrating a point up and down into the surface of the water. Right? We'll get circular waves spreading out. We can do exactly the same thing with uh, these plane waves, right? And plane waves you can imagine in the same sort of way, a tank of water, but this time we've got a straight edge like a ruler, and we're just vibrating that up and down into the surface. So we'll actually get uh, straight wave fronts coming out. And you can do the same thing then for uh, the phenomenon of, of diffraction at a barrier, which we'll cover in a little bit more detail later on. So in this case, it's been drawn as, as plane waves coming up here, meeting a boundary. So at every point along the wave front, we draw more of these secondary wave fronts that Huygens invented, and then look at the envelope created by those. Right? Now on this slide we've just got three points shown. Uh, Huygens' principle is that you actually do loads and loads and loads and loads of these along the way from. Um, so anyway, as I say, some people find this useful. Uh, what it illustrates in this case, for instance, is that um, you will get some light intensity beyond the barrier. Okay, so light does go around corners. Yeah. Does this work for a non-uniform source? So if the source isn't repeated, the wave gets random. Well, then in, in our definition of what a wave is, it's, it's outside the scope of that, right? We talk about a regular repeat oscillation. But, I mean, so, you know, that's just a technical nicety. But in principle, yes, it is. Right. So even if you just did one oscillation, and sent out a wave front from that, you would still get this effect at a barrier. Okay, we'll look at more examples of this later on. Um, 
diffraction effects at barriers are a really, really important uh, topic in physics. Okay, so first topic then is reflection. Um, so let's talk into those plane waves because actually that's a lot easier, although this works with circular waves as well. Uh, and I'll show you an example of those uh, in the next slide or so. But let's take it now as a straight wave front. In other words, the crests of our waves are um, linear and parallel to one another. So it's meeting a reflective surface at some angle. I'm going to talk about what the angle means in a second. Um, what the law of reflection tells us through copious observations uh, is that the reflected wave front is going to have the same angle to this reflecting surface, whatever that is, as the incident wave had. All right? This isn't going to surprise you. Anyone who's looked into a mirror knows that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Right? Um, so it's not new. Um, if we're looking at circular wave fronts rather than, than um, um, plane wave fronts, then we have to think about it in terms... Well, it's exactly the same process. But of course now we have to consider uh, every segment of this curved wave front as it reaches the reflecting surface. It's still coming off with an angle of reflection which is equal to the angle of incidence, but of course that angle of incidence is changing because we've got a curved wave coming into a reflecting surface. Um, so they look slightly different. Um, there are two photographs here taken from uh, a water tank, essentially. So in this case, we've got a point oscillating in and out of the surface, so it's giving us these circular outgoing waves right, from that oscillating point. And here's our reflecting surface down here. And what we see is a reflected wave coming back off that surface. It, it's obeying the rule that I gave you on the previous slide, but as I say, because the angle of incidence is changing as this circular wave front reaches the flat surface, so we get a changed angle of reflection. But it's all operating under the same rules. Geometrically, how you would uh, describe this, draw this, uh, is to essentially take the image point of your real source. So, right, this is sort of that distance above our surface, so we imagine another point down here, which is also emitting uh, circular waves, right? It's shown diagrammatically down below. So this is our real source of oscillations. This is our real wave front, which is hitting this surface what gets reflected back looks as though it's come from this imaginary point on the other side. Right? So that's just an easy way to apply the rule that the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence. Uh, for a plane wave, it's a lot simpler, of course. Here's our reflecting surface. I don't know which direction this is coming, but let's assume our plane wave's coming in this way. And so originally, you know, it's quite a long thing when it's out here. It's hit this surface. This is going to be our angle of incidence. What is that? About 45 degrees. So the angle of reflection is the same. It's 45 degrees. So this wave front's coming in. This one is now being propagated out. Um, I'm not sure how useful these are going to be, but we'll have a look at one of them anyway. if it still exists. Sorry, obviously a little bit slow. Oh, so this is using Huygens 
secondary wavelets to illustrate the process of what's going on. Don't worry about the lower part of this curve, that's actually showing refraction, which is our next topic. It's just this yellow stuff we're looking at. So we've got a wave front coming down to the surface, and at each point we've got the angle of reflection is equaling the angle of incidence, and so actually we end up with our plane wave going off uh, in that direction over there. This is drawn with 45 degree uh, angles on here. Okay. Now, as I said yesterday, there are loads of these cartoons on the web. Yeah. Could the outgoing wave is going back out in that example up to the right interfere with those coming in and therefore screws the whole thing up? No. no. It doesn't. Uh, there are some interesting bits of physics there, but I'm not going to digress down that road because uh, that would take us forever. Um, there's some stuff we do in our research which is, um, relies on the fact that you can't always tell what comes first. But anyway, let's stick to this because otherwise it would be the entire rest of the lecture telling you about stuff that I'd really like to tell you about but we shouldn't really spend the time on. Um, Okay, so here diagrammatically is what we've just seen in that cartoon. So we've got our incident wave coming down here. Here's the wave front um, A to B as a point on this wave front happens to reach our reflecting surface. And here's the reflective wave going off. Uh, so here's the reflective wave front going from C to D. All right. Now this is geometry here. There's nothing terribly complicated about this. The thing we must remember is that everything is taking place in the same medium above the refracting surface. In other words, there is no reason to believe the wave speed is going to be changing. Now that's not true when we talk about refraction, which we'll, we'll come to in our next topic. But here, everything is travelling at the same speed. Okay, So, that means that it must take exactly the same amount of time uh, to get from A to D uh, as it takes from B to C. The lengths of those lines must be the same because the wave speed is the same. Which means that these two triangles, A, B and C, and A, D and C are congruent. Now those of you who've forgotten your basic geometry may need to go and look up what congruent triangles mean, but the essential result of this uh, is that that angle there must be exactly the same as that angle there. In other words, the angle of incidence must be the same as the angle of reflection. All right. Now, so far, I've not given you a key parameter about these angles. They are always, 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 always in what we're going to be talking about measured with respect to something called the normal. And this is the normal. It is the perpendicular to the res reflecting surface in this case. Yeah? But it's going to be defined always as the perpendicular to whatever interface we have between <coughs> medium 1 and medium 2. So it doesn't have to be a line, as on that diagram. It could be a surface. So if this bench, for instance, was our uh, the interface, right? we're talking about an interface now between air and wood, the normal to that surface is a perpendicular to the surface. In other words, it's at right angles in every direction. Yes? And the angles will always be measured with respect to that. That's our reference direction. Um, so do remember that because sometimes you're going to be doing calculations that will tell you about uh, not that angle, but that one, for instance. And you're going to have to remember to subtract it from 90 to get the, uh, um, the angle that we're actually going to be requiring. Excuse me. So that's reflection. Um, okay, next topic, refraction. Um, somewhat different now because we're going to be moving from one medium into another medium. So actually the wave speed will change. All right? The speed of light changes depending on what the light is travelling through. So 
when people rather lazily sometimes talk about the speed of light being a fundamental constant, actually all they're talking about is the speed of light in vacuum. The speed of light passing through window glass is not 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. It's something different. Okay? So, wave speed depends on the medium through which the wave is traveling. Uh, and actually, in water, for instance, uh, the wave speed is affected by the depth of the water. So if the wave travels from deeper water to shallower water, uh, we'll get a change of wave speed. Right? And that can produce, uh, even in something everyday like water, it can produce um, this phenomenon called refraction. All right, so uh, when we've got a setup as shown on the slide here, so we're going from deep to more shallow water, then uh, the wave uh, is actually going to uh, have an angle that is closer to the normal after it's crossed the barrier to that it had an incidence. Right? So the angle of refraction is going to be less than the angle of incidence in this case. Right? If we went the other way around, uh, if we went from shallow water to deep water, the opposite would be true. The angle of refraction would be greater than the angle of incidence. Right? So it's entirely, you can run time backwards, basically, in that setup and get something that visually looked exactly the same. Um, okay, so we can do the same thing with light. If we've got light entering uh, a, a glass block, say, from air, uh, then the angle of refraction, so the angle the light has to the normal inside the glass block, is less than the angle of incidence, the angle it had to the normal when it came in from air. And that's because the wave speed has changed, the speed of light has changed. And that gets described by this uh, relationship called Snell's law, which is a very straightforward relationship, and I'll, I'll do a quick derivation of it for you in a few seconds, just to show you where it comes from. Uh, but it says that the sine of the angle of incidence over the sine of the angle of refraction is equal to this number called the refractive index. Now this specifically is for light coming from air into a medium like glass, okay, a transparent medium. Uh, if we were coming from water to glass, we'd have to extend this equation a little bit, and in a side or two's time I'll give you that fuller version. But for now we can use this simplified version. Uh, and this refractive index actually turns out to be uh, associated with the wave speed in the medium. Right? When, when, it, when this law was originally uh, stated in this sort of form, that's not what was known. This was through observation and so on. But we know that now. All right, so here's our water tank experiment. This is coming uh, from deeper water into more shallow water. So here's our plain wave fronts coming into this submerged barrier here, which is altering the depth of water. And you can see that our refracted wave is now at a different angle to the interface compared to our instrument. Right? And it's shown diagram diagrammatically down below. Okay, the wave speed has changed, and that's changed the direction of these waves. So we have an angle of incidence here, which is measured with respect, uh, sorry, between uh, the direction of these wave fronts and the normal, and the normal is coming out of the surface like that. And the angle of refraction is now closer to the normal uh, because we've uh, we've changed the wave speed in the way we have. The same thing, as I said, is true going from air into glass. Or air into water, right? This is the swimming pool effect. When the swimming pool doesn't look as deep as it really is. It's because we've, what we're seeing is the effect of refraction. The light rays being bent, as it were, refracted as they go through this barrier between air 
uh, of water. It's exactly the same principle. But you'll notice again it's reversible in the sense that if we come out the other side, so now we're coming from glass to air, right? So the angle of refraction at this interface is actually the angle between the direction of the wave there and the normal to that interface. This angle is now greater than the angle of incidence on the inside. So it's the opposite of what we had up here. Does it always be called the, 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 yes. the original? Yes. Okay. Right? Because it's following that equation. Right, so basically we've got whatever that fraction is going from air to glass and then all we're doing is flipping it upside down when we go from glass to air. So it will always be the case, for instance, that this line here, this direction here, will be parallel to that one there, must be, because that's true. And again, there's some cartoons on here, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to waste time looking at those. Let's look, let's look at something local. Anyone recognise this? Uh, well, Tankerton, so just along from Whitstable. This is something called the street in Tankerton, which is actually quite an unusual uh, phenomenon associated with longshore drift along the North Coast. Right? And it produces this spit of land that you can see at low tide that comes out from uh, Tankerton slopes. Right, so where you see the hundreds of beach huts on Tankerton slopes, those of you who visited, this is essentially coming out at right angles to that row of beach huts. Uh, and it's quite an extensive structure. This is before the wind farm was put offshore when I took this uh, photograph, so some years back. Uh, the old World War II forts protecting the Thames estuary are still there, obviously, but the wind farm isn't. So, this is, this is the sort of boring thing. Sorry, this is another view from the side. Um, so the Isle of Sheppey, you can just about see hazy in the background there. and right? just orient you. So the Thames estuary is the other side of that. All right? Get to know the geography of your local area. Um, now, being the nerd that I am, um, I noticed that we had some refraction going on uh, along this spit of land as the depth of water changes. Right? So the wave fronts were coming in, these are essentially plane waves coming into the shore. But in this region here, they're getting a change of depth. So there's a barrier. It's not a sudden barrier, it's a gradual barrier. So we don't get a uh, a sharp change of direction as we had in that setup two slides back, we have a rather more gradual change, so there's a curve rather than a, a discontinuous change. Right? But the wave direction is quite evidently changing. This is his beach huts, right? Just to orient you. So the, the wave front is actually changing more gradually. But it's purely because uh, I think I drew some lines on here. Yes, I did. Um, and I probably did down there as well. Yeah. Um, purely because the depth of the water is changing. So you can observe refraction even in you know the most everyday common or garden things. Right? This is a twice a day occurrence with the tides. You just got to take a bus trip, right, to see it. Um, so there we are, refraction on the Kent coast. So let me go through um, a quick derivation of this. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on it because this is not something I'm ever going to expect you to reproduce. I just want you to know where Snell's Law comes from right, in terms of, of a construction of the sort uh, that we did for reflection earlier on. Um, this is our Snell's Law that we had up earlier, and I told you that the refractive index was coming out of the fact that wave speed was changing. And in fact, it's a very simple relationship, right? It's just the speed in medium one, right? So that associated with the angle of incidence divided by the wave speed in medium two, the medium that's associated with the angle of refraction. 
Okay, and that then, because of our wave equation, uh, ends up giving us a proportionality uh, with wavelength as well. But it's wave speed, the one that we, we're going to end up focusing on a lot more. So our equation here, remember, was based on the assumption that we were going from air into some other medium. Right? So glass was the example we used for light. And in air, the refractive index is defined as 1, because it's actually, you know, the speed of light in air is pretty much the same as the speed of light in vacuum. Uh, but if we've got some other medium, all right, so we go from water into glass, whatever, you know, setup you want to imagine, uh, then we need to be a little bit more sophisticated. So we end up with an extension to Snell's law, which is sine of the angle of incidence divided by the sine of the angle of refraction is now the ratio of the refractive index in medium 2 divided by the refractive index in medium 1. All right, we had assumed when we're coming from air that N1 was 1. All right, so we ignored it. This is the fuller version of Snell's law. If you find it easier to remember it this way, then, then remember it that way. But this is, one way or another, an equation you really ought to commit to memory. Because it's something that people are going to assume, I will assume, uh, that you know. Right? It's one of those basic, basic, basic physics equations uh, that you need to carry around with you. <coughs> Uh, I have to say I prefer this one because it collects you know, everything associated with medium 1 on one side and everything associated with medium 2 on the other side. I just find it easier to remember. Um, but it's up to you. So here's where it's coming from. We've got, again, plane wave reaching this uh, interface between one medium and another. Right? The diagram we had earlier, we just looked at reflection. Now we're going to look at what happens when we get to refraction. So it's no longer the case that the length of that line in our right angle triangle here, B to D, is the same as the length of that right angle triangle there, A to C, because the wave speed has changed. Right? But the saving part of this is that the time it takes for B to reach to D is exactly the same as the time it takes to get from A to C. Okay? The distance is different, but the time it takes is the same. So this is where uh, the, the mass gets a little bit more complicated, although not very much, because um, what we can actually uh, write down then is... Oh, I get rid of whoever's stuff this is on the board. Um, yeah, let me write this out fully. So, time taken from B to D, what I've just said, is the same as time taken from A uh, to C. So, the length of this line divided by the length of that line Well, speed is just distance over time, remember? So if we're going to write our distances down here, we can put C1 times T over C2 times T. It's the same time, remember? So obviously the T's will cancel out. Yes? So here's where we get the signs in. It's, oh, it's so easy, this stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do is rewrite this equation as that. All right, so I'm dividing top and bottom by the length of the line uh, AD. Yeah? That's all I've done. And that immediately, given that these are right angle triangles, remember, uh, is going to give us a couple of signs. We've just got opposites over 
I bottom uses, you know, two right handed triangles. That's all that is now telling us. And that, of course, we've already written as that. And our refractive indices um, are proportional to the wave speeds. Okay? So, we end up with snow off. Last thing I want to do this morning, just a bit of history. Uh, and this is pure illustration. There, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of illustrations like this we could talk about in physics. Uh, but the guy who got the credit in terms of having his name applied to this equation uh, was someone from the Netherlands uh, working in the early part of the 17th century. Actually, there were two people who got there first. Uh, there was this guy in, uh, in Britain about two decades earlier and loads, loads earlier. This guy in the Middle East actually got to exactly, this is, this is out of some of his manuscripts, uh, got to exactly the same place. Um, actually, Kepler also worked on this, although it didn't get very far. Um, and um, independently of smell, this chap, uh, Rene Descartes. Anyone come across Descartes before? Good. Um, I think therefore I am, etc., etc. Very famous philosophical statement. Um, he came up with exactly the same thing in France. And again, entirely uh, independently. And the reviews I've read of this, it was an article in Physics World, I think, way, way back, uh, basically said that, that Snell's presentation of refraction was actually probably the least satisfactory of all four. But nevertheless, uh, is his name associated with, um, with the equations for refraction? So there we are, just a little bit of historical curiosity to add to it.